Welcome, everyone. My name is Sarah Odsley, and I am the Writing Across Media Facilitator at Vermont Studio Center. So it's always a pleasure to bring someone to our virtual stage who has been here as a resident. And so I'm so pleased to be able to introduce our reader tonight um, for our Writers on the Rise reading series, which is a spotlight reading series designed to uplift and amplify the diverse talent of a wide ranges of voices and creative visions um, in all genres. Um, and this series is sponsored by the Rana Jaffe Foundation. We are really grateful for their support. Nana Nguethi is an AKO Kane Prize finalist and alumna of the Iowa Writers Workshop. Her work has garnered fellowships from McDowell, Cambelio, UCross, and the Wurlitzer Foundation, among others. She is a professor of English at the University of Alabama, and it is my pleasure to introduce her and bring her onto VSC's virtual stage. Thank you for being here, Nana. Thank you so much for that generous introduction, Sarah. And thank you to the Vermont Studio Center Writers on the Rise series for hosting me this evening and the Lana Jaffe Foundation for making this event possible. I'm in great, incredibly grateful to all of you, dear readers, dear viewers on the screen for helping me to continue to introduce and usher my collection, Walking on Cowrie Shells into the world. Tonight I'll be reading excerpts from two stories that give a sense of the range of voices in my collection. The first story is Rain Check at Momocon. It's a coming of age narrative set in the comic book world. It chronicles a young woman, Astrid Atangana, her, as she goes on a journey to find her own hidden superpower, her own sense of agency. And then I'll be reading from Kinks, the final and longest story in Walking on Cowrie Shells from whence the book derives its name. Rain Check at Momocon. There's a crush of stormtroopers, men of steel, and Optimus Primes milling around the cavernous confines of the Javits Center. Surrounded by freaks and geeks, Astrid Atangana wonders how she and her friends, the Nyanga girls, come across to the Comic-Con crowd. Bola, rocking grills and street gear, calling herself Fly Girl, Superman's dope ass cousin from the hood. Mimi in the Psylocke cosplay costume, pre-ordered from China a full month in advance. And her, a too tall black girl in a too short red kimono, wearing bifocals no less. She takes off her glasses. She cringes, thinking about the Princeton admissions letter secreted away in a notebook in the far reaches of her knapsack, then secures the bag straps along with the side slung holster of her katana for what feels like the kajillion time. Ooh, Batman has a bomb booty. Mimi opines, twirling an ely purple hair strand that slithers and coils around her index finger. Her flinty eyes are fixated. Medusin, Astrid thinks, filled with equal, par equal parts fascination and disgust, watching her friend watching yet another dude. Which Batman? Bola asks. There are like a billion Dark Knight wannabes up in this piece. Look at these clone boar mothers. Him, 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 him. She points and the gold gun charm on her stiletto nail swings wildly at each offender with an eye shot. Folks is so basic. It don't matter if they hot though, Mimi says, jerking her head to the left. Do right there could totally get it. She answers their blank looks with a rapid whisper. Him, the retro Adam Westy one over the, by the halo booth. Then loudly, oh my God, Astrid, don't look straight at him. Astrid is already looking straight at him, staring in fact. Bola rolls her eyes in exasperation, yet all too soon she is staring too. Batman catches their gaze and gives them all an even two tic-tac grin. Mimi denies him a smile. Instead, she turns away, flips her synthetic tresses. 
then tosses him a knowing, coquettish look over her shoulder. Classic Mimi, Astrid thinks. She hopes he's worth it. Hope home, hopes homegirl gets a bang for her buck. Mimi has spent two weeks worth of pay to buy her wig. Its shock of violet locks had to be the exact same shade of purple as her costume. The cheapo wigs at the beauty supply in the mall where they all worked were deemed insufficiently con-worthy. A schlubby East Asian boy wandered, wonder sidles over and palms Batman's left butt cheek. His wandering hand partially obscured by a waterfall of midnight blue polyester. Manhandling, Astrid thinks, her brain continuing a week-long streak of randomly churning out M-words, morphing her into some Tourette tickish freak. It was weird, but strangely familiar. Like the month after their class trip to see Hamilton on Broadway, when quotidian conversations tempted her to segue into song. That month, talk of Batman's Heine might have triggered wormless wordless humming of Sir Mix-a-Lot's 90s throwback hit. <laughs> Baby got back under her breath. Mimi is glaring at the dynamic duo now. Look, Astrid, it's one of your fairy tale up the real rear endings. Bowler sniggers her approval of the this. <laughs> Maleficence, Astrid thinks. She mentally kicks herself again, forever, ever, sharing her slash fan fics with these so-called friends. For months, they had cracked on her about Luke Skywalker letting Han Solo stroke his lightsaber during long and loading, lonely nights on broke back Tatooine. She'd almost given up on writing before she met Young Yoon at Arcania their mom's comic book store. Young was the one, the only one, who hadn't laughed at her writing. Instead, he had pulled out a sketch pad and shown him her all his storyboards, shared panel after panel of darkly rendered swordplay. The only text was his name in Hangul. They're pretty much just mimes right now. I need someone to give them a voice. Can you help with that, Astrid? And Astrid, knowing what it was like to be kept mute, had said yes. Young was upstairs right now, manning their spots in Artist Galley, the one they had spent months scraping together funds for in hopes that they could really make a go of all of this. Silently, Astrid packs up her ever-growing collection of jet stream uniball pens, her glasses, and finally, her notebook, its pages full of secret letters, story scribblings, and haiku descriptions of passersby. Rotan Robin comes, caped crusader smiles, grateful. Their night play begins. Astrid doesn't want to come back, doesn't want to return to the cutting laughter and faux camaraderie of her frenemies, but she knows she will. She is Elastigirl, Q said trombones. <laughs> Bending and contorting to the will of others in a single fold. She hates this about herself, knowing that she will give up all this comic book craziness and cave under her mom's pressures to head off to an ivy far, far away. It doesn't take x-ray vision to see this, but for now in this fantasy land, nothing is decided. She is surrounded by mild-mannered accountants, data entry specialists, computer analysts, assorted neckbeards, all shedding their daytime skins, drilling to their secret identities in a dreamscape freed from the mundanities of life. For a brief time, they are all heroes. Her too. All right, thank you for that. And now I will transition and this story is uh, the Mansion Kinks. I call this story a tale of heartache and hair grease. Um, it's broken into sections named after Black women's hairstyles. And the particular Black woman at the center of this story is named Jennifer Chanda. 
and she is in love with a firebrand of a man named Dr. Kwame Johnson. Their story is the testament to the road of relationships, kind of crooked road, right? And relationships can be full of complications and full of kinks. Here's a section, pressed. When Jennifer was a child, her mother had pressed her kinks with a hot comb each Sunday night, each Saturday night. By Sunday morning, her hair was as starch straight as the pleats of her church dress. When she was bright eyed in Sunday school, Jennifer saw her obedience as Christ-like, saw the lick of holy fire in the blue flames of the oven range, grew to welcome her hands meekly folded in her lap the molten hot comb as God's shining instrument. It was about enduring a test and a testimony. She never squirmed, though her mind filled with premonitions of hellfire during the brimstone sizzle of her strands. Still, there were signs and wonders to be had in the steadiness of her mother's hand. She was never burned, bore no errant mark of Cain. Her mother was faithful to this evening ritual these kitchen vespers. God forbid the rapture come and her child was found nappy and wanting. As a young woman, Jennifer and her hair grew unruly, roamed free and unfettered, nights wild and her own. This was how she felt now on Saturdays that Kwame came to her, demanding many, many, many things, both monstrous and delightful. She learned to relish Sunday morning's bruises as the signs and wonders of their sweet tussle. Knowing she too had marked him with tooth and nail and the slick of her tongue. Only with him did she discover her appetites, how she liked the rough mouthful that was, that was the word fuck on her tongue, almost as much as the thing itself. I had to trace her toe along the seam of him just to watch him grow shivery, becoming a herky-jerky creature, a thing unspooled. After he had gone, back to parts unknown, she would lie there short of breath, yet finally fully alive, her face pressed to the sheets to catch remnants of his smell, a smoky, spicy thing that brought to mind foreign altars where the righteous sacrifice loved ones to their insatiable God. Blowout. Kwame kept her in bed for days at a time, sweating out her blowout, edges and toes curling again and again. In moments between, she would lie along the stalk of him, tracing twin scars along the hollow of his side. Battle wounds, he answered to questions unspoken. Ear to chest, hair tickling her cheek, his voice a grumbling lullaby, telling tales of ancestors, of kings, of queens from Africa past. He claimed them by birthright. No genealogy sites traced his DNA across the diaspora, yet by his estimate, he was descended from Sheba and Sundiata, from Makeda and Menelik. He joked about his credentials, a Morehouse, Princeton, and a Harvard alum, bread and buttered on the stoops of bed where your street cred, the only pedigree that truly mattered, was measured by number of shots survived, by who and how many feared you. He was cocky, completely at ease in his skin and his identity. He was seductive as fuck. Head on his chest, Jennifer sometimes bit down on his nipple till she drew blood, craving him, suckling in that knowing ease for herself. She, the child of a timid mother, ever grateful for kitchen scraps. One of only two black girls in her Scarsdale Elementary School. Her mother had stayed mute on the subject of their culture. What did she know about heritage? Her brilliant ancestry. No matter how many boardroom doors Jennifer walked through, sometimes she felt her steps falter in the Ghanaian beauty shop at the wing tribal meetings. She felt like a counterfeit African. Felt the unworthiness of the maid's child, 
tiptoeing through the servant's entrance, lightly, quietly, like she was walking on cowrie shells. Thank you. Hi, Sarah. Hey. I want to know what happens next. Before <laughs> <laughs> the book. Oh I know, everyone, you y'all need to get the book. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm wondering if um, there are any questions from the audience um, for Nana about her project or, um, yeah, or about her beautiful uh, backdrop that she made with her friend behind, which now needs to be written in an essay or something. <laughs> um, Nana, were you working on some of that, some of your pro some of your current book when you were at Vermont Studio Center, or were you working on something else um, when you were in residence um, in the winter? <laughs> I know. I actually came, yeah. like, you know, Sarah was talking about people coming to Vermont, and I remember I was there during the beautiful snow-capped, like, the Red Barns world, for, like, looked like a little snow globe setting. It was Red Barns and maple trees and snow, and there was a campus cat that was, like, mysteriously walking across that bridge every moment. I, is that cat still around there? Like, ever was cat? He a, is he a black tuxedo cat? I, yes, I think so. I feel yeah. like he was like a miracle cat because he was so agile on the snow. I was like, how are you walking around when all of us have are basically, we need little, you know, we need like canes and whatever. It was, you know, it was very icy, <laughs> but he was very, very yes. live, I would say. <laughs> he was very live. Houdini. Wow. Houdini is the black cat that has been here for a long time. Yeah, he would just show up everywhere. And that bridge was like his, I don't know, that I, I feel like he would maybe was a, a troll guarding the bridge or something like that. He was under that bridge and over it. And every time I walked across the bridge, he was somehow miraculously there. So um, yeah, I was I did write some of this the portions of this story, like or kind of hone and edited some of the work that I was that was under underway. And I was also working on a novel at that time. And that novel was still in progress, I feel like there's some, you know, more work to be done around that. Um, yeah. So how do you feel about working on projects concurrently, like a short story collection and or a collection of anything alongside a larger project like a novel? Um, is it is it helpful to have two different projects running concurrently? Um, I just, I'm a poet, so I don't understand, I don't really understand the demands on a larger, longer narrative project. Um, the, yeah, it seems daunting to me, um, but it might take me 10 years to publish my first book. So, um, but, you know, just hearing how long, um, a, how much of a commitment in time and endurance a novel, the creation of a novel is, um, is something that I'm, I'm always fascinated by when I, when I hang out and talk with my fiction writer friends. Hmm. It's interesting for me because sometimes like, you know, when I was stuck in with a novel, like going back to writing shorter fiction or short form fiction, it kind of like helped me invigorate the novel writing process. So I, I, I think that, you know, dibbling, I like to dibble and dabble in between the various forms so that they kind of like jumpstart me when I'm feeling like, oh my God, this short story doesn't want to end. It doesn't want to resolve itself. I don't know where it wants to go. Then maybe I'll just write a poem. In this actual book and collection, there's a post poem. Uh, like I feel like, you know, as a writer, I just try to use whatever um, medium it tells the story the best way. Like um, Schoolyard, Schoolyard Cannibal was the prose poem. Initially it was, I was trying to tell it in like, you know, standard, uh, long form, no stanzas, no nothing. I was just trying to tell a story. And then I found that, you know, I was trying to do it as a lullaby. I did all these things. And then I I read Claudia, Claudia Rankine's um, Citizen. And, and I was like, oh, wow, this is a really um, a format which kind of allows me to kind of um, very simply and very kind of um, in a very condensed fashion share like some of these very deeply personal and un painful anecdotes and it allowed me to kind of be in that space so the prose form worked for me there so I'm one of these people like I say that you know 
whatever medium works, I will explore it because some, the story will out in some way, you know, and that is, that's fine with me. Like, you know, if it's going to be a novel form, it will be. If it's going to be a short story, if it's going to be um, prose, a, a prose poem, if it's going to be straight, like a poems. I mean, I, I, I admire people who use even like tell stories via Twitter and, you know, and Instagram captions. I did an Instagram caption story, which was like a flash fiction piece. And I was just like, oh, 300 words and having to tell a story in that micro novel project was incredibly like, you know, satisfying, and gratifying to just get it out. And, and the, the, the density of it just makes it so much more like every morsel had to have be full of flavor, you know, so I loved it. That sounds so fun. Yeah, I, I like um, thinking about the constraints that we put on ourselves as writers to be able to find the correct form or structure to bring a, a narrative or a story forward um, is is one of the, the joys and the challenges of the writing process. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, what how the lines have become blurred in, when we describe certain genre, the genre distinctions that are driven by our capitalist society. And just thinking about, um, you know, how, you know, we can't, we can't write towards those genre distinctions. Um, and it seems like it's more freeing to be able to allow the project to choose its own form um, without thinking about I'm I'm writing an essay or like I'm or like I must write a, a story with you know 5,000 words or whatever um and yeah I totally agree I think some of those those distinctions are very arbitrary and they like when you when people are trying to make you write towards a particular section in a bookstore it can feel very kind of constraining and you're just like and not the good constraints we're talking about, right? Um, you know, it can feel like, oh, well, you need to produce X, Y, Z amount of pages, and it has to be about a certain type of protagonist, and it can has to it has to be, you know, I mean, on that, I mean, I I enjoy constraints like, okay, I don't like, you know, I write in this story, there's in this collection, there's a whodunit, so I like the idea of that, like, you know, murder mystery aspect. I have some magical realism, so that is what it's freeing but when you're in a, in a situation like you're saying capitalism is just making you feel like okay you're basically you know you're not the store you're not the storyteller you're basically like you know an arm of a machine that's telling you to kind of produce and that's not what the writing process is about right you're not writing towards so you can be in black interest you're writing just to be to write and tell tell the narratives that you want to tell you know um I know you're a professor as well as a, a writer, and I'm wondering um, how your 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 teaching process um, or your 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 practice of teaching and guiding other writers or uh, or teaching about different particular topics um, informs or or needs to be in balance with your your writing life. Yeah, I mean, for, fortunately for me, like some are. I'm teaching like a really wonderful graduate school and graduate fiction class. So um, I find myself feeling very invigorated by conversations around literature with my students and feeling like watching their fledgling steps as, you know, as creatives, it makes me feel, you know, it kind of um, renews my own belief in the arts and just and makes me feel like hopeful about like writing, especially during COVID and pandemic, you're just like, what is it all? What is the meaning of life? You know, like it, you, you just, you really didn't feel like, oh, it would make sense to be playing with your imaginary friends on the page. It just didn't make sense to me. So, <laughs> you know, through teaching and talking to writers and young writers who are very, you know, they take this seriously. I felt, I remembered why I do this and why I find the whole enterprise very joyful, you know, and I needed that particularly at that time. Yeah. Um, are you reading anything that you're enjoying right now? Um, anything you would recommend? It's interesting. Like I, I just, I, you know, read my friend, yeah, Jesse's Transcendent Kingdom and I'm reading um, Kevin Brockwire's uh, The Ghost Variations. I hadn't been reading for pleasure because of, you know, teaching obligations and, and editorial work that I was doing on my own collection. So I hadn't really allowed myself to kind of like, you know, be in a non, 
you know, personal work, you know, centered space. So, but now it's summertime and I'm feeling I'm vaccinated <laughs> and feeling fancy free. <laughs> so, um, so um, I'm excited about reading and just, there's a couple of things that I have on my Goodreads list. Like, you know, like, so I've been ordering books left and right. And like, you know, it's just, it's getting a little scary. Like, it's like, a, like, like a little bit of a Jenga tower on the side, my bedside table. <laughs> it's just like picking books, like randomly. Okay. Like I'm going to read this today, you know, and, and it's helpful for me too, because that's how I get excited about like writing again. And so like, you know, I remember like, oh yeah, that's usually what makes you want to write is sometimes when I'm reading a, like particularly delicious phrase and then I'm just like, oh, I've got to put this book down and write. So nice. I'm happy that I'm having the opportunity to kind of to be in that modality again. So awesome. that sounds really lovely. Yeah, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the process of, um, um, I'm almost done with Brian Washington's um, memorial novel. It's a novel. Um, yeah, he was, just, he was just recommended to me like like last week. So yeah, I hear I hear the sh the story collection, um, which is called Lot, um, is is really good. I am starting with the novel, so I will have to go back to the story collection. The story collection came out before the novel, I think. Um, but yeah, I've been I've been really enjoying it. And um, the no before I read that, I I read um, How Much of These Hills Is Gold, um, which mm. I also enjoyed. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I, I've been reading a lot of, of we, I did a monthly book discussion for VSC. Um, the last book we read was Girl, Girlhood by Melissa Thebos, which is a collection of essays. Um, mm, lovely. But yeah, it's, it's nice to have a, a reading life that um, is, is also inspiring of, of a personal work too. Um, and yeah. Uh, yeah. Any any questions from the audience? Feel free to drop them in. And um, I, I also in the chat I've added some links because if you don't have the book, please purchase the book. Um, I have a question for you, Sarah. I was wondering oh, yeah. whether no, I was wondering yeah. did you want me to read like additional work? Um, I did prepare like a number of pieces, and you oh, know, yeah, and sometimes things go fast. Love... Something some things go faster than you expect. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I yeah. I was like, like oh, oh no, like. Uh, I'm, I would love to, hear, whatever you feel like reading, um, please yeah. do. Yes, I would love to hear more. Um, I love that your reading enlivens the characters and, mm. and I can see them, you know, and I, and I can't wait to like read the per certain sections that you've, that you've read for us tonight. So I'll have your voice in my head. Um, mm. And I'd love to hear also like the, you know, and the prose poem too, like anything you feel comfortable reading. Yes, please do. All right, sure. So I'm going to read right now. I'm going to read a snippet from like, because a lot of people always ask me, like, what are you work, working on now? And I'm working on a sci fi novella that's about this um, young alien teen named Blue Ch Jupiter. And she's growing up in Brooklyn, New York. Um, the it she is from a race of like um, intergalactic slaves. So their slave ship actually crash lands in the Hudson River, and they end up being kind of quarantined in the hood, right? And I've, I've written the opening prologue in the, in the style of African-American toasts, which were born out of a tradition of rebellion and against oppression. So you think like Staggerly and Shine, um, and they tend, tend to kind of be like deliciously vulgar sometimes, so <laughs> so be aware. Um, and this, and then I also write like also the, the alien dialect that I feature is my mom's um, tribe dialect. Um, so I love it because it's family K, and I get tickled at the idea of imagining geeks at Comic Con parlaying in African dialects and having no idea. I mean, like they think it's like the talk, the talking and Klingon. I mean. I've been watching, I'm a big old blurred, by the way, I'm a big sci-fi nerd. So I was watching the show C, I don't know how I just came upon the Jason Momoa's um, C, uh, what is it on Apple TV, which I did not have. So Jason Momoa, it, everywhere he goes, like he infuses like, you know, his own like, you know, culture. And so that he does the, you know, the hapa dance, like the war dance. So he's doing it. And, and like, I think the language might be, <laughs> Maori, but I have to check. But I'm like, oh, look at you, Jason Momoa. Look at you doing that, putting your culture in there and making it the alien <laughs> like the <laughs> culture. I love it. All right. So I'm gonna start off. I'm just gonna read. This is a very short portion. This is like I said, this is the prologue that's kind of like um 
telling the telling the tale like so it's a futuristic story and then past the time of the jupiter there comes this you know another time when she's written about like in the lore of like you know of these aliens that came upon you know the earth and changed it uh, you know irrevocably all right the legend of blue hear them tell it Blue Jupiter lit a blunt on a sun ray, then came blazing down to earth on a comet's tail, all Hollywood in HD. Hear them tell it, this bitch was badass, stood seven foot three with black hole eyes and a head full of freaky deek hentai tentacle dreads. Hear them tell it, she ran the number one stunners. Homegirls was slanging and banging and turned up in the club, Captain Kirkin and twerking. Here, tell it, she blasted a hundred punk ass Negroes with a bullseye laser, laser shot right out her left titty, then pissed stardust and shit asteroids all up in their skulls. I hear tell her piece was slaves, interstellar kunta kintes, but she wasn't having it. She pip slapped Massa and Turned his wifey out too. Mm, mm, mm. I hear tell she ain't die. Queen Pin had a wormhole just swinging on a solid gold chain and straight jetted, straight jetson, right out of this world. Word? Word. All right. So that was just the intro to Fight Like a Girl. <laughs> I have oh a fight God, scene too. That's, that's so fun. I love <laughs> yeah. it. Um, I, I don't know whether I should keep going or going. Should I keep going uh, some more? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, and then there was one comment in the chat, but yeah, keep going. That's so fun. I want to hear more. Okay. So that was excerpted from the annotated compendium of Earth's First Contact Folklore, edited by Tiberius Califaxian Jones III in the year 2215. All right. So now I'm going to take you back to um, 2030 when when Blue Jupiter and her folks first arrive. For Blue Jupiter, ex-shy girl turned extraterrestrial fly girl, the number one Sunder crew is everything. The crew is family, the crew is foundation, the crew is freedom. Crew love is why on her 16th birthing day, she's standing on a no-name dirt patch in the ass end of the projects kicking some human girls behind. The crowd around them is hyped, screaming, fight, 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 ground pound her ass. It's her first battle solo, so Blue's cocking her rival Stilo. Homegirl's a southpaw, throwing jabs from the left every single time. Only one had landed, but that is hurt like a ma. If her kind had hearts, Blue's would be thumping and thudding right about now. As is, she's gasping, nearly blinded by sweat. She squints, guard up, chin down, moves in low, then pa pow! Across a right uppercut, fist connecting with blow, bone and flesh. Yes, the girl reels back. But wait, this just pulled out a box cutter? Not really against the rules, because there were no rules. At the Mickey D's on Flatbush, she'd once seen a girl get stabbed in the eye with a diamond tip lead press on nail. Focus blue, she's coming, swinging wild, jump back, fuck. She, they circle each other. Blue's thigh is aching, she glances down, she's bleeding, blood lusting, stamping up dust, the crowd is hollering. Slice that squiddy hoe. 10 minutes after the battle, this ish will be viral. Phones all up in the air, filming each punch and blow uploading to Crossborough viewers who get off on watching UFO bitches catching a beat down. World star! Lou was just a baby when the slave ship carrying her family crashed down from the stars, but folks still throw fucking bammy and squiddy in her face on a regular, like she asked to be here, like she didn't belong. She gives the crowd the finger. Yeah, what? You see me now? Good. She's tired of this ish, dead tired and still bleeding. But right now she hears the crew yell, blue, blue, boom, ah, yeah. blue, blue, zam, zam, blue, blue, boom, ah, yeah. blue, blue, zam, zam. Mixing human fight chants with tribal cries of the Bamanikes. Recharged blue charges. 
tackles that tr trick ass hood Barbie to the ground, straddles her, clamps down on her, her skull. She bashes and bashes and bashes till the drip, drip, drip of red blood puddles in the earth below. Her saw are squirming now, really wriggling out of her headband. Blue feels finger in socket, electric, all the way live. All right, so that was the story of Blue. <laughs> So the beginning fun. of yeah oh man that's i that's such a that was so fun to hear thank you um and yeah i'm like i can like i see visual i see the, the visuals like in, <laughs> you know yeah thank um, you uh nate who nate who's in the chat has has said awesome in all caps with five, <laughs> five thank you nate points. Um, That's the story I'm working on. Like, you know, I'm working with a composer who actually is like, you know, so he actually has a cybernetic clarinet where he's going to put like, you know, I did a reading of it yesterday and sent him a voice clip. So he's going to put my voice through like the cybernetic clarinet and like mutate it into some weird like extraterrestrial type of like, like in a vacuum in space type of sound. So we're trying to do like you know, he's making music and I'm going to be like writing in response to the music. So that novella is still underway, plus other stuff happening around oh, it. So that sounds so fun. Um, yeah. So Nate asks that about your two previous readings, that they both had a strong sense of voice. How important is voice to you in your writing? And do you start with voice or dot, dot, dot? Oh, yeah, Nate, it's like you're, you know, you're having your own x-ray vision into my mind, like Ash you talked about. Um, I, I absolutely start with voice. Um, as I tell people, I have a very strong speaking voice and like I'm a nerdy person who's very introverted and I'm in my head a lot. So if you like, you know, my own inner voice is very strong. So my characters have to have incredibly strong voices and my narrators have incredibly strong voices and they say, and, you know, so to kind of get through the din of all the things I'm always thinking about. So I always start with voice. Um, I even have little nicknames for some of the voices in my in my collection. Like I call, like you know, I have a, a the devil is a liar is a, a tale of astro you know Afro Christian spiritual warfare, and that has a kind of lyrical and sermonic voice. I have another story that has like a kind of hard tonk, honky tonk, and hard boy voice, and you know, this one was like kind of you know. Um, hood patois poetics voice that I just read. So each of my stories has its own kind of like, you know, like sound and I know the narrator or the protagonist is, it, you know, they like the Comic-Con one you saw, like I went into like Kajillion and the Lingo Peens and it's just in that kind of like Comic-Con, there's a lot of like allusions to geek culture. So each of the stories has its own world and voice and kind of like, syntax and lingo that's specific to that world thank you that's awesome thank you nate nate do you have a follow-up question or any i can't wait to to read the book i mean that's i i think i think voice is just really interesting when you get other another person's voice in a story it really pulls you in in a way that description or even action sometimes doesn't so and i think that's that's to me it's something that's deeply human that I can't quite figure out maybe I don't want to maybe it's not the point is not figuring out the point is just letting it flow and letting it go yeah you're singing my song Nate I mean that's how I tend I was talking to um I had another talk yesterday where I was talking to my friend yeah Jesse and she she says she starts with like usually like an image so I think every writer has their way of coming into a story and I could see that like the images because I like sometimes like you know some pieces in my collection are fantastic. There are images that are included in the book. That Comic-Con piece has the image in the book. And I knew, always knew that there was going to be like a comic you know, book image because it just made sense. But I started with voice first. So we each have our own way of kind of like making our way into that creative space. Any other questions? <laughs> thank you for that Nate oh uh thanks Patricia she says uh wonderful reading inspiring discussion of process and writing thank you thank you for that Patricia 
are you is anybody writing in the audience like patricia nate are you guys are you working on something yourselves i know like a lot of these vsc writings might be be frequented about you know past fellows um, this is Patricia Bender. I'm not a past fellow, but um, it really is inspiring to hear writers like yourself, not just reading your work, which of course changes it in all the great ways that people have said. But this, your discussion of process, including what you just said about, you know, how we enter the, the creative space is, is really, it really is inspiring. Um, and, and those things really stay with me. Um, you know, like something we read and we keep thinking about, things like that stay with me too. That that was really great. And you're absolutely wonder. I agree, the characters that you draw are so, just from what I've heard tonight, are so alive, um, which is really fantastic. So thanks oh, very much. Thank you, Patricia. I was just telling Sandra before, like, you know, like I wish that, and you know, when you, I just, this is my first book and it's out in the world, but like, you know, it's, it's in these kind of moments when I get to talk to people who are reading or, or in conversation with the work that I like, it reminds me that, oh, I actually did publish a book because, you know, I'm really in this coat, we're all in our little COVID, COVID bubbles, bubbles. So I'm not really getting a chance to do one, you know, in, you know, in a bookstore book tour and talk to readers. And so I, I'm so appreciative for that comment. Thank you so much. And your comment to me. Thank you so much for your question. Yeah. Can I ask one more question? Is my hogging? I don't even know how many other people are on here. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about spirituality, because you touched on it a couple of times and religion, and it's something that I struggle with. I want to be a spiritual person, but I find so much about religion turns me off, but I think it's also... <clears throat> deeply a part of who we are is that we're more than just flesh and bone, I think. So how do you address that in your writing, I guess? And how do you think about that as a human being? What is it they already tell us not to talk about me, like um, money, religion. <laughs> Thank you, Nate, for getting sure. me jumping in. Let's just get into it. I'm just, let's just like, you know, blow everything up, right? Right. Um, yeah, so for me, like I consider myself, this is just not a, the, the person, not the author, but I'll talk about the book as well. Like I'm a, I consider myself a spiritual person. I think we do get turned off sometimes by organized religion and it's very, it's strictures. And that is of man more so than of like, you know, the thing that's beyond like flesh, right? You know, um, for my book, I have a particular story that's set in that church setting in the April Christian spiritual warfare and that devil is a liar is kind of touching upon this this movement of this really strong African charismatic church with which takes like you know like Christian tenets and beliefs and then kind of marries them to like African belief systems like beliefs in like you know jujus and witchcraft and it's very interesting right because you know like it's like the that idea is so strong it's and I think like here in the West, like we think of the devil and evil as a more kind of abstract thing. But if you believe in like witchcraft, like, you know, evil is a real thing. So um, they, in that story, we have like, you know, the marriage of those two things happening through the lens of a mother and daughter who are going through a difficult and trying time as the daughter questions her faith because she's pregnant and she's dealing with trying to make sure that her baby um is safely and healthily born into this world. So she's questioning her own religious belief systems and the mother, you know, and her, her cohort of, um, of, in her church are using like that spiritual warfare to kind of fight these forces of evil that are, um, you know, are keeping her, her child from having a baby first and then also now maybe having a healthy baby. So um, it's interesting, interesting for me to kind of tackle that. Like I don't have any answers. so. Sometimes when I'm trying to figure out things about religion and my own belief systems, I use my, I write into that. I write into those spaces to kind of, you know, think and about and interrogate those, those ideas. So that's what's happening in that story because that, that charismatic church where they lay hands and there's a lot of um, emphasis on pro um, pro prophecy and prophetic, um, prophetic um, visions and um, healing you know, it's not something that I was born into. It's like here in America where people were, are born into churches where the, the pastor regularly like handles snakes as part of his, you know, 
uh, right. his his Sunday sermon. So I wasn't born of that particular tradition. So that tradition is parallel, and I was interested in exploring that world and doing it respectfully and understanding where that need for that kind of combating evil um, came from. But while also kind of you know having the daughter like be more of like my trying to kind of deal with her own faith and coming from a more more Western um, mindset. So. Right. Well, there's a lot of power in the handling snakes, people. I mean, that's real, like, there is something there, I think, not that it's my religion either or my tradition, but you can't dismiss it. And the power of community and religious community is extremely powerful for good or evil. So anyway, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Nate. Yeah. All right. Before we go... Before we close, there was an opportunity for uh, the people who signed up for this um, reading to get a tote bag um, from Grey Wolf Press. And I just want to make sure that someone gets that. So um, are there any last minute burning questions for Nana? All right, I'm, I have this bowl. Oh, yes, Julie, go ahead. Julie, did you have a question? Yes, sorry, I, had, I was muted. <laughs> oh, okay. um, I do have a question. I grew up biculturally. I was raised in the Central African Republic um, and I have friends from Cameroon. And I have and am writing stories about my experience um, growing up and have received a lot of pressure from agents to politicize my writing and that's not my desire my desire is to write stories that take readers sort of beyond personal and national borders um but i'm just wondering if if that's something that nana could speak to or if that's um, something that you've run into as well Oh my goodness, like you're singing my song. <laughs> Julie, was it? Would Julie correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, Julie, I mean, I think this, first of all, like it's like this is like a one in a million me, me talking to somebody who knows a Cameroonian. <laughs> it's like we're like unicorns. Everybody knows a Nigerian because they were the most populous. <laughs> so thank you, my Cameroon sister, <laughs> in some ways, you know. Um, I, it's very interesting when people write about Africa, there's a, a sense that people, um, I remember writing and saying that, explaining to people that I am. I am very interested in showing the, I guess, the diversity and nuance of our experiences as human beings, more so than focusing on these very kind of, it bleeds, it leads um, headlines that people seem to kind of need when they're writing about Africa, like the whole war torn and famine stricken. It's very tropey, it's been overdone. I'm t I say that those stories are important to tell. Um, I leave that to the journalists. It's important to tell. If that is your, you know, if you have a vested interest in telling those stories in a fiction form, more power grease to your elbow. But that is not the only story that needs to be told about about people from the continent. And I, you know, write in direct opposition to that. I mean, um, I do have a moment where I talk about, you know, I have a story set in Boko where there's a mention of Boko Haram. But I was more interested in the humans in that story than like the idea of an oppressor. And I always say that I don't want the only time that people recognize our humanity as Africans to be when someone is pointing a gun at our head. So, you know, there are no warlords in my stories. I'm not interested in that type of like trauma porn that seems to be, you know, the, um, I guess, to be privileged, you know, I mean, I remember writing my MFA thesis and saying, war, what is, what is it good for? Apparently, marketing stories about Africa, right? Because at the time, every story had to be about that, right? And once again, I'm saying, this is not to dismiss that some of those narratives need to be told, but I think there has to be, always be a counterpoint and like a multiplicity of stories that are being told. So it's interesting to me that you are um, also saying that that is what's happening and like, you know, push back about, uh, against that with everything you have, because if that is not coming from an authentic and real place within you, you know, your reader can feel that on the page. Like we were talking about, um, um, Sarah was talking to me about sometimes like the 
exigencies of the publishing industry and what they want you to write and like, you know, feeling that pressure, don't do it. Because when they ask you to do those things, it comes from a very disingenuous place. And I feel like the readers can sense that and you will not get no joy, so. Yes, thank you. That, yeah, that echoes my my deep felt personal sentiments as well, but um, I didn't realize how prevalent that attitude still was in the publishing industry. Um, so it's been, I don't know, a little disheartening, but very encouraging that writers like yourself are, are telling a different narrative. I mean, good stories were out, you know, Lee, so uh, just keep on writing and keep on writing these in a place that gives you joy and, you know, and people who recognize that will publish you. So, but, you know, if there's, it is what it is. Like sometimes people have their narratives and they're stuck to it because they think that it's a formula that works and that will sell. Like, you know, their idea of what is authentic is very narrow. And um, I mean, I even had a conversation like, and, and I'm working with a press that is incredibly, incredibly supportive. So they allowed me to be involved in the, the book cover design. And I was sending all these essays. I was just like, please just don't put a baobab tree and like, you know, an elephant, you know, and it wasn't a, a slant, it wasn't a slight of the designer. It was just literally like I, I sent them a graphic of these very kind of narrow conceptions. They just showed like every story about Africa had an elephant, a baobab tree. It was like a desert landscape. It was like a sun setting. And it's just incredibly reductive. And, you know, and it makes Africa seem like this exotic other when Africa is just a continent in the world, you know, and filled with 55, sometimes 54 countries with a multiplicity of tribes and ethnicities and languages and people who are living their lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for asking the question, Julian. Um, I'm a poet, so I can't really speak to the fiction writer publishing world, um, but I also recommend um, you finding an agent or an editor that uh, understands like where you're coming from. And what I mean by that is like, if you can find a, a person of color, um, I don't, I, well, I don't know if that really 100% matters, but I know like Pernisha Jones is um, the editor at Northwestern University Press and um, Anyway, there's, there's opportunities for your work to be, uh, for someone, for you to work with people who believe in your work and aren't asking you um, to write towards the white gaze and, and publish in that, towards that, and only that. So um, I wish you much luck. Um, I'm still considering that for myself as well, so. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. yeah. All right, so I do have this, Full, and there's some pieces of paper in it of the people that signed up to attend this reading. And what do you think? If, if they're not here, do they not get it? Or do you have to be here? What do you think? Are you asking me? I can't. Yeah, I, I don't know. I defer to the magic bowl. <laughs> yeah, okay. so. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna close my eyes and pick a name. And that's the person of the tote bag, the winner of the tote bag. Uh, Christina Nowecki, is this your, your, your... Are you serious? Is that my mom? Because she already has a tote bag. <laughs> oh, okay. Your mom, okay. Your mom signed up and she's not here. <laughs> <laughs> she, my mom has this issue with getting onto some of these events. Oh, like she'll be okay. struggling with it. I'm just like, mommy, just click the, the Zoom link. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. Okay. I'm here. Know. I'm here, but I don't need a tote bag. I'm here. Oh, okay. You, you are here. Okay. Yes. I, I don't need a please. <laughs> All right, all right, okay. Sorry, you were outing my mom and she was actually in the audience. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Nana's mom. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, sorry. I apologize, Nana's mom. And also my dog is barking and I apologize. All right, one more, one more chance, one more chance. All right, Kathleen March. Kathleen, are you here? Nope. She's not here. Well, maybe we should. Do, can can you look at the I guess the range of names that are there and just see? I don't know how to do it. Um, I'm not an expert at these raffling. Okay, but so Patricia I, Bender and Nate or Nate Bay. Nate's here, I think. 
All right. I feel like I want to be like Oprah. Like if I had enough bags, I'd be like, you get a bag, you get a bag. (laughs) (laughs) All right. All right. I'm going to scroll through. I'm going to scroll through and I'm going to only have the names of people that are here. Excellent. All right. Okay. Patricia Bender, you're the winner. Thank you. Thank you. So, Patricia, I I will email you to get your, um, what she's saying, a a very rich evening in many ways, and the raffle part was fun. (laughs) (laughs) And you won. Yes, you won. All right. So, Patricia, I will follow up with you via email, and um, you'll get a tote bag from Grey Wolf Press um, with Nana's cover art on it. They're really beautiful. They look like they're, they're beautiful bags. Um, anyway, thank you so much for being here, Nana. Thank you for reading. I loved hearing your new project as well as your current book. Everyone go buy her book. I dropped the link into the chat. Um, support your authors, purchase their books from independent press it, um, independent um, bookstores. And if you want, you can support um, our book, our local bookshop, our local bookstore which is Ebenezer Books. And I'm wrapping a link right now directly in. And I hope you have a fabulous evening. And thank you for being here tonight. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Good night.